Jay Horowitz here with my friend of over 25 years, Mike Piazza. Special edition of Amazing Conversations. Let me test your memory. May 23rd, 1997, okay? Um, we traded you the day before. So I sent this limo to LaGuardia Airport to pick the you up. The 98, you mean? It's 98. Yeah, sorry, yeah, 98. I was like, okay, I was like 97. I sent this gigantic limo to pick up LaGuardia Airport. Uh, you were late. We, 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 we wanted to do it pressing before we couldn't do it. Yeah. I almost got fired because of that. They ran out of news that night. You get into this, this limo, it had to be like four foot before, four foot before long. And yeah. they said, Jay, what are you doing? I said, we got this superstar guy, want to roll out the red carpet. We had a press conference in this small Jets locker room. Remember that? Yeah, of course. Yeah. I also remember the funny thing was that I believe I was on the way to Fort Lauderdale because I was with the Marlins, uh, obviously. Right. And uh, so I'm on the way to the airport. And somehow, uh, I just out of intuition, it's like, is this ticket out of Palm Beach or, or Fort Lauderdale? And then it ended up being West Palm Beach, so. You got there right before the game. Yeah, right? yeah, I mean, it was, it was pretty crazy. Honestly, it maybe was a blessing in disguise because. You got a double. I had, yeah, I had no time to think. Light a pretty shot. I'd never caught Al before, yeah. and Al, you may or may not remember, that he was very difficult to catch. I mean, yeah, yeah he had a hard cutter. He, right. For a catcher, it was for me. It, it took some getting used to, but the good thing is I didn't really think about it. And the pitcher, I think, it was Jeff Judner through that yeah. day. He was he was tough. I mean, so it wasn't the. I remember. I think I grounded out weekly my first at bat, and I was thinking, this isn't a, a we great day. We didn't have a big conference room, so this is more yeah. just locker room. Nine million people crammed into the room. Yeah, it was pretty intense. Yeah. And it was pretty cool. I mean. Uh, and again, you know, as I said before, as we talk about the Mets, the good thing is that they had started putting the pieces in place right. for a good team in spring training. They traded for for Al and right. for Cookie, and um, you know, we had we had a good. I mean, they were a good little team. I mean, even Bobby Valentine right. said, you know, Fonzie and Ola Rude and and I had played them the year before in '96, and I'm thinking these these guys are pretty good. Yeah. So the good thing is that I was able to come into a team that was pretty. Right. Yeah, had some good ball players and, and yeah. a good group of guys as well. With a lot of pressure on your shoulders. There was, but again, I think, um, and, and maybe at the beginning, I put too much pressure on myself. You know, it's just natural. You come to New York and especially in a city like this and the expectations are high and I just was pressing a little bit. I mean, I was getting some hits. I wasn't really driving right. in big runs. So I remember I would get a couple of hits and then hit a double play in the in the seventh or eighth inning and, and was starting to get booed a little bit. But uh you know, as I said before, it was kind of a rite of passage for me, and it kind of made me tougher and realized that you have to be mentally tough to play in New York City. Mike, this is going to air like a week before 9-11, so we were at a firehouse today. You know, it, it, one thing that really struck me, it really hit home for me, you, you said like 9-11 is our identity, you mm -hmm. know. The home run had gotten on the play. You always, not try to pop poop, but it was no. more than a home run, but the whole 9-11 thing, we had a great club. I mean, when I die and I, on my tombstone, Ring was great, but what we did as a club in 2001 was something I'm really proud to be a part of. You and Al and Franco, Zio, Ventura, Fonzie, the whole group. It's, yeah. yeah, I never heard that before. It really is our identity. I mean, it's, it's an organization. No, and that's true. And I think it really was, you know, you mentioned all those guys. We were, as much as it was coming into the modern era, we were still pretty old fashioned, traditional guys. You guys got it though. Well, that's what I was saying. We, we always felt like we were still part of the community. And even though the game was shifting a little bit into the modern era where they're, you know, big money and, and big um, uh, expectations and, and TV and all those things, we still felt a special connection to the community. And um, so when obviously 9-11 happened, we, we, or just all of us, into it in it is our intuition to just want to roll up our sleeves and do whatever we can to a man one through 25 everybody yeah everybody. no and it was it was uh it was really like i said it just came from a place uh from the heart it wasn't like we felt obligated and we were not told to do it you know as you know um fred and uh, mr doubleday were like look you know if you guys if you you're not obligated to do anything you know we're gonna have something we're gonna do what we can to help and and start to to you know, roll up our sleeves and, and some guys did that. And some, some guys just wanted to, to visit, you know, and, and pick, pick the guys went up. Went to Ground Zero, went to the police yeah. and fire stations. And 
parking lot was turned into a recovery area. Yeah, area. and some guys did that. And, and so, you know, Al and Johnny and myself and guys, we went down there and we went to we met, met with some guys that actually survived and were pretty banged up physically and emotionally and met with some of the families, obviously. And there was still a lot of trepidation that week. Uh, and it was it was tough. It was tough emotionally, but uh, but, we just did what we could. You know what I remember about that time uh, is that um, after they hit the home run, um, Sports Illustrated did this gigantic story on a firehouse, and you wouldn't want to be photographed with the firemen. You said, they are the heroes, not me. It was a gigantic story. I remember they put the young kid on the cover or something, mm. you know. And, I mean, what made you even back then want to kind of, it was great, we won, home run was great, but I'm not the hero. Yeah, I think just reality situation. I mean, we look at baseball and it is a important part of, of, of our of our society, of, of our community, of our city. But again, it's just still a game. I mean, it's still something that we do as a job and um, it's not life or death. And so I just felt like it wasn't appropriate for me to be with, with the guys who had you know, risk their lives and especially from the houses that that lost guys and just I mean, I appreciate the fact that people still identify and um, recall the home run and 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 that week generally. And also on a side note, I think it's really the last few years, some of the comments that the Braves have made, you know, like Larry Chipper and right. guys that have really we won. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's that shows how emotionally they were invested as well, yeah. which probably doesn't get a lot of credit, but I think uh, it just shows. I mean, you know, Chipper Jones was is an amazing, was an amazing player, superstar. He was always a thorn in our side. Right, yeah. But you can see how well-rounded he is as a human being. You know, the compassion, him and Brian Jordan, other guys that, that were on that team as well. So, um, but yeah, I just, I felt like I just wasn't comfortable at the time sort of being in that. Uh, Even today, you really kind of, I remember up to the home run, the, the press stuff, you kind of, you did it because I, you know, make, we talked about it, but mm -hmm. it wasn't your first priority to talk to the press that night after the home run. Yeah, I mean, well, again, truthfully, we were still all emotionally yeah. wrecks, I mean, and, and scarred, and um, I didn't really, uh, you know, I think it's nice, and, and I think it's, it's really special that it's taken on that longevity, the significance of that night. Uh, and there were a lot of other significant parts of that night. It was the first sporting event. Right. There was a lot of confusion. Well, just we didn't know if it was the right time, if it was if it was too early, and eventually we knew we had to get on at least with with life, and it was something that we were all very uncomfortable with. So that's that's another thing that we were sort of not really. Um, we just we just had a lot of anxiety. I should go back to the firehouse today. One thing mm -hmm. you said to me struck me. You said that we should use 9/11 kind of as a learning tool. For future generations, you met with a family, three young kids whose yeah. father was killed. I mean, could you expand on a little bit what it means? What is a learning tool? Yeah, well, I think it's not so much that. It's so much that we should educate the next generation. I mean, because all of my children were born. You know, my first child was born in two thousand. Um, you know, two thousand seven. So. It, if this there's a whole generation now coming up that didn't experience it and especially in the city and i think we are obligated and to to educate them on it yeah. and and obviously there's there's still parents and grand and children that are affected but as these generations get older i think it's important that we continue to educate them and, and uh, for for obvious reasons for the bravery the example the bravery and the and the courage and the commitment but also, um, you know, that, that how it happened and, and that it doesn't happen again. And, and that's something for me that I think is important as we sort of transition into um, the, as the years go on. Were you struck by, you know, you, you, you spent most of your time in Italy now, but were you struck we, you know, we to the firehouse, how much the, the charisma is still there, how much it means to come down here and visit the guys after, you know, what, 22 years? I mean, it's an honor. Like I said, I've always enjoyed coming back to the city. And, um, you know, one thing for me that was very special is when I got traded here was was the fact that um, and I've mentioned this before, is that with the Mets, generally they don't embrace 
players that are not sort of coming up right. through the organization. Right. That's just been a, a sort of a trait, I guess. It's like a family, you know, they don't really take in or at least embrace guys that didn't develop or at least come up sure. as a Met. And uh, so for me to be embraced in, in yeah. that way and be identified as a Met is something that I consider, you know, my, one of my most personal, you know, best accomplishments. But, um, but, but going back to that time and going back to, to when I got here, I think I made a mental, I made a commitment that I knew I had to roll up my sleeves and, and just be, be among our fans, you know, be among the community. And so they get that. And they also, you know, they could smell, they could smell people that aren't genuine about 100%. it. So that, that for me is, um, as I said, something I'm most accomplished. Yeah. Mike, some men might know what you're doing now. Heavily involved in Italian baseball, managed a WBC team last year. Yeah. Got two wins, qualified over Cuban and Netherlands. Yeah, C Cuban, uh, qual Qualified Netherlands. for the next WBC. Yeah. Do you enjoy something you can get your teeth into? I do. I mean, it's definitely um, nerve-wracking. I mean, it's not easy managing a club, but I will say that going back to what I mentioned about team, I mean, I had an incredible coaching staff. I enjoy it. I mean, uh, being in Italy now pretty much uh, full time, my kids you know, speak fluent Italian and um, it was something that I'm so happy to have um, given them that experience. And, you know, when I played for Italy, something I did it as a tribute to my dad because he was just so proud and so grateful for his Italian ancestry right. that I figured, figured it was a great opportunity. And when I first played, it was sort of the twilight of my career as well. It wasn't like maybe I right. could have played, you know, for the U.S. team. So I thought it was a great thing, but it became a relationship and I've been working with them since 2006. I still enjoy it, you know, again, as long as I don't have to do, I mean, I have a good staff and if I get people that <laughs> kind of help me out, you know, it, it works, it works pretty well. Yeah, how did you recruit? I mean, well, we, we, I have an amazing um, team coordinator. His name is Gianmarco Faroni. He's uh, Italian Canadian. He grew up in Canada, but he speaks fluent Italian. He's from, um, Abruzzi and uh, he's amazing. He worked for Major League Baseball a few years, but I mean, he does the research and started finding out that these guys Did you mainly, have to make calls? Well, like, yeah, of course. And even like a guy like Matt, Matt Harvey, we found out that he's yeah. eligible for his Italian passport right. through his mother's side. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's important. And I've said many times before, you know, it's important and it's, a great, it's great for baseball when more teams in the Classic are competitive. Because everyone knows, I mean, the U.S. and Japan and, and the Latin yeah. American teams are going to be competitive. But for me, if we just go out and, and are not able to, to be competitive, and that also includes native Italian guys. So we have about 10 uh, guys now that are in college and uh, right. professional baseball. So the ultimate goal is to grow the game back in Italy and get more guys that are from Italy. But uh, of course, it's always good to have a little help that guys that we can we can you know do the research. I was the PR guy for Team Israel, right? So we played against <laughs> Paul, Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Dominican Republic. We beat Nicaragua, but we were yeah. we were in a bad bracket, you know. Well, it's tough. I mean, and then we have to play Israel in Europe in the yeah. championships, and uh, you know, honestly, it's not easy for us. I'm trying to figure out when did Israel become European, but. <laughs> um, well, it is what it is. I mean, look, I, I, I like international baseball. I think it's fun. I think uh, the guys enjoy it. Will you do um, the Olympics too, Mike? That's a good question. I don't know. You know, Jay, you know my life. I mean, the way I live life now is just go year to year. You know, I, I don't know. I, I, my ultimate goal is to hand it off to the next generation, people who are really interested and want the game to grow. Um, you know, we've talked to MLB about growing the game European-wise, right. you know, maybe eventually trying to get a game you know, a major league game. And that's yeah, they go to the other countries, why not? Yeah, I mean, they do the London series, which yeah. is pretty cool. But I mean, I think continental Europe would be cool as well. And so it's going to take some, some, you know, investment. I mean, it's not cheap, but I think the incentive is there. And um, we'll see, maybe before my lifetime ends, we'll, we'll have a, a game, Gentlemen, a major league game in Italy. I got to ask you a question. And they've been to Italy. How is the pizza in Italy? The pizza is great. That's where they invented pizza. So they actually invented pizza in the Naples area. And it was named after uh, the, the queen at the time, which was uh, Margarita. So when you have a Margarita pizza, that's the original pizza. It was, Not pizza, it's better than pizza. Uh, well, I would hope so. Well, I mean, look, it, it, there's all different styles of pizza. And, you know, it's like there's all different styles of uh, hamburgers and steaks yeah. and all that stuff. So, but the original Italian pizza, there's two different styles from uh, Napoli 
which is the Naples style, and right. then Sotile, which is more the Roman style. Mike, you're still in the wine in the last time we spoke. You I am, I am, and I try to wash myself with the wine because it's it's a it's a dangerous hobby. And uh, like what for me, one for you. Uh, yeah, no, that's exactly right. <laughs> I mean, you get you you got to be careful. But no, I do, and it's obviously been in Europe. You know, wine is 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 yeah. of culture there. And which city do you live in, basically? In I do. I live in Parma now. Yeah. And so um, it's nice city. It's uh, it's actually a very famous city in the John Grish Grissom uh, novel called Playing for Pizza, right. which is about an American yeah. football player who went over there and played football. You can look at me, I love pizza, Mike. Yeah, yeah. well, I could tell. Yeah, it's thanks, good. Mike. <laughs> I know you, you keep up with the Mets. There's a couple of Mets questions. Uh, yeah. Francisco Alvarez, your thoughts? Uh, well, look, I mean, uh, I think he's a great young player. I think... Uh, Ultimately, it's going to be about his defense. You know, I think he, he's going to swing the bat. Uh, and um, it's, he's young. You know, it takes time. I think he's shown a lot of ability. Uh, I think recently it was good that uh, he can, um, that he's going through some trials and tribulations. All great players have to struggle a little bit. So I watched the, the telecast recently and I saw that he was having a tough time. But, and I thought to myself, good, because it's a good opportunity for him to work himself out of, of those times when you're not playing well. But, but again, I think generally the team, you know, has made a commitment to try to get a little younger. And I think uh, youth is important and hopefully they can get the right mix. You, you, you were, you know, with some criticism about the Mets moves, the Scherzer, were Verlin or trade. You had to take, you thought it was a, Good way to make a break and start forward? Yeah, I mean, look, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, it's tough to win, and it's almost and it's very difficult to win in New York. Uh, and I think sometimes you've got to make hard decisions. You know, you, uh, I know the fans aren't always going to see eye to eye, but I think last year they had a good year. You know, obviously the playoffs didn't work out, and now you have these guys that are really proven pitchers. But again, they're not, and they'll be the first to tell you, they're not the youngest guys. Right. And so I think you have to kind of say, okay, at what point do we need to make a move here? And you look at this season, you know, the, the June was probably the thing that really, you know, uh, damaged right. the season. But you still got to move forward and, like I said, make the hard decisions. So I'm, I, I think it's good and, and youth is important. So they got some good prospects and, and we'll see. You know, it's not, it's not easy to put, uh, put a winning team together. Like how old are your kids again? So my oldest now is 16, right. uh, second oldest 14, and 10. My son is 10. So none of them, did, did they go back to non Olympics? Did they have an idea of what the transpire? My, my oldest one now is because of, obviously, YouTube and things like that. You right. know, you can watch these documentaries, and she's really taken an interest. And um, I explained to her, you know, what happened. And, and they're very um, intuitive, you know, and I think it's, it's something that... Uh, I had to be very careful in the way I explained it, but uh, but I think they still, it, it's, you'd be actually, I think New Yorkers would be somewhat impressed with the general knowledge of even Italians. Because living in Italy, when they talk about 9-11, they have a certain reverence for that event. And it affected them just as much as us, right. but in a different way, obviously, because they weren't as directly connected. But I've been impressed with the sentiment and the, the feelings are still very strong and, and the education. I mean, they, they know what happened. And so it's something for them that they, they hold in a very, um, That's what you talk about the teaching. The, uh, yeah. I mean, again, you don't realize what, what we as New Yorkers, obviously it hurt us the most in the heart because we right. were closest to it. But I think people would be interested to see how, how much reverence it does have it all over the world, and Europe in particular, because that's where I've been spending most of my time. Yeah, one of my favorite guys to meet was your dad, Vince. Mm. Oh, he was to come to Philadelphia with this gigantic veal palm and hero sandwiches. The big cheesesteaks. Yeah, yeah, the cheesesteaks. Uh, so. Every time we saw we got a big round of applause, we knew we, knew we were good that night. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, he, he loved the game, and... Um, he was he was obviously a big part of of where of my success just on his work ethic and his love for the game and so and you're still involved with the car business too yeah we're in the car business in philly so if you need a car piazza auto group 
I mean, we we have a lot of stores now. We've grown a lot in the ten. He used to get me cars for the players. I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> I used to nag him. They used to call me. No, and no, no. But you know, I'm in partners with my brothers. We, you know, my dad started the company over 50 years ago. Yeah. So it's like crazy. I mean, the yeah. way the time flies. But uh, my brothers are involved in that. They do an amazing job. Yeah. And like I said, we've been in business in Philly area for you know over 50 years. So it's really a family business, and it's. Um, my yeah, brothers do a great job. My the last thing, when I, you know, the firehouse today just brought like a lot of great memories for me. It just a feel good thing to be part of that. You know what I mean? We won a lot of games, championships, playoffs, World Series. I mean, does it mean the same thing when you walk in there again? I mean, today, today was a special visit for me. Yeah. yeah. Well, those those emotions are always great, especially the, the, the positive emotions. And when you see how much you affect people, um, in a positive way, it's really rewarding. And yeah, I mean, I mean, life goes on, life gets in the way, you know, as I've said before, I started my family later than most guys. So I'm still, you know, I have a 10 year old son and um, he runs me around, man. You know, I start to think, man, I should have had my kids, you know, when I was in my twenties, I probably would have been a little uh, more, less tired at the end of the day, but it's it's all good, man. And, and they love New York, you know, my daughters, uh, so I, I'm looking forward to having a relationship with, with this team, with this, with this community in the next, you know, in the, in the future, because it's something that is part of my fabric. It's part of my history. And I want my kids to know about it as well. Last question. How do meatballs in Italy? Meatballs in Italy are not called meatballs. They're not called meatballs? Okay, no, no. I called, love meatballs too. They're called popette. Popette? And they're not as big, not you know, they're, they're just not as big yeah. as the American ones. So you can get, yes, pasta, uh, spaghetti, right. and popette. And uh, it would be in the same realm as uh, the same size as Swedish meatballs. Okay, well, that's too small. Yeah, but yeah, so, okay. but you can eat a lot of them, I which probably you probably would. would. Yeah, yeah probably so, get them all over so, so when you go to Italy, don't say, you know, spaghetti meatballs, you know, <laughs> say pasta e popette. Uh, I'll remember. All right. Listen, thank you for okay. your time, my all friend. All right, Jay. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, man. As always.